in low tide, which was around 8 o'clock. You know, it was a miserable time to be on the tide. <laughs> so I didn't collect any new sea urchins. So I'm going to, in fact, take one of the sea urchins here, and we're going to inject it with uh, 0.5 molar calcium chloride. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And we're going to see if it will spawn. Uh, and the reason that this class is split into two is if we're successful with the spawn, then you're going to be able to see the sperm and the eggs, and then after a period of time, you're going to see the cells start to divide. And that takes time. So that way it can evolve during between now and 1 o'clock is when I guess I'm going to be seeing you again. Because I'm not certain that the sea urchin is going to be uh, fertile, um, I have a second uh, uh, objective that I'm trying to meet. I'd like to go through um, the, basically the overall taxonomical breakdown of all the animals that are in the tripods, and specifically the animals that are in the uh, clutch tank. So on your desk, on your table, uh, everyone gets a generalized chart. And that way, when I start saying Latin words, you can at least look to see where that's at. Okay? But what we want to do first is we want to start by um, getting a sea urchin and um, injecting it with this uh, 0.5 molar potassium chloride. I wanted to talk about that just for a, a brief minute because I was thinking about this last night. Dr. Rock, there he is. Um, why would injecting potassium chloride in an urchin cause it to spawn? So potassium chloride is a soil. And, and so one of the things that could possibly be doing is when you inject a salt in a solution, you change its osmotic pressure. That means there's more things dissolved on one side of the membrane than on the other side. And that would mean then that the animal's gonads would start to pump water out, which would also cause it to spawn. So it could be from osmotic pressure. It could be, in fact, because the gonads are being relaxed because of the potassium. Because uh, sodium and potassium are basically moving across a nerve when, when the nerve fires. So functionally, I'm not sure why this works, but I've been doing this for years, and it works. But what has to happen is the animal has to be prepared to spawn. That means if you inject them at one month, and you wait six months later, you may not find it again. How many of you have ever seen inside of a sea urchin? Anybody? Okay. Depending on the time of the year, you won't see the gonads. They reabsorb their gonads completely if they're not if they're not ready to spawn. So they take environmental clues that actually causes their gonads to grow so that when it, the ocean conditions are perfect for releasing the uh, basically for producing water, releasing their gametes, then they'll be able to spawn. As they start to spawn, you'll see clouds of things in the water. How many of you have seen spawning in the touch tanks? I know a few of you have, yeah. Because we get that happening here as well. Now typically, that's the way you can tell the boys from the girls pretty easily, just by the color. If it's white, you don't think it's a boy. If it's not, it's a girl. Generally speaking, the eggs are visible, which is why we have the microscopes. So the second thing that I wanted us to be able to do today is to compare some of our microscopes. So we're going to be at, looking through the dissecting scopes, which are primarily the ones that have the two line lenses on them. And we're also going to be using the compound scopes if, in fact, we get some gametes out of the sea urchins. So that would be our, our secondary thing is to give you a chance to use these kinds of cool microscopes. How many of you used microscopes before? Okay, well, at this point, while I'm mixing up the stuff, why don't you try turning on your microscope? There's buttons, they're all a little bit different, and there's side numbers, there's side things on the side here. I checked them last night, and they all work. Now, if you don't have a light on your microscope, you might have a I'll work on that until you didn't. It was working yesterday, of course, and now it's not working, so I'll get another light. So I'm mixing uh, 1. 1. 1.13 grams in 30 milliliters. To figure out molarity, you have to look at, you look up the, uh, uh, basically go to the periodic table, and you look at the uh, atomic weight. The atomic, the atomic uh, weight of it in one liter would be one molar. So I'm making a much smaller solution, 30 milliliters. So it's 1.13 grams. This is what 1.13 grams of potassium chloride looks like. This is a graduated cylinder. This is what 30 milliliters of seawater looks like. I dump that in there like that, swirl it around, it all dissolves. Then I take a syringe, and I pull the syringe through here and inject it into the urchin. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to walk over to the tank, I'm going to grab a sea urchin. Now, 
Whenever you try to move the sea urchins in the touch tank, what happens? It breaks something. We don't move them around because basically what happens is the the suckers, the, the, the two feet, stay attached. And if you keep ripping them, keep moving them around, they won't even have enough two feet in order to feed themselves and in order to move around. Now, the, the mystery behind the, the uh, suction cups, I'm going to leave to Ralph to explain because he has a really in-depth explanation for you all on how it works. The simplest solution, which was when I was going to school, it was just suction. Basically, it pumped water out, and uh, that made like a kind of like a plunger, you know, like we use in our, in our toilets. And yeah, that's a nice, simple solution, but it doesn't explain why this, why the sucker, why the two feet would stay stuck to the glass after you pull the sear tubes off. Because wouldn't that just break the suction? So the, the, the real answer we'll, we'll wait until later in the day. Um, picking up sea urchin is if you do it really quick, really quick, it's usually better. If you, if you don't, if you hesitate just a little bit, oh boy, it's really hard to get apart. So just real quickly, there's a top and bottom of the sea urchin. If I was to inject this where the mouth is, where would I inject it? Uh, on this side, right? Where do you expect the gametes to come out? On this side or on this side? If you were to guess, the top, bottom, bottom, it's actually going to come out on the top. Okay. Now, the other interesting aspect about this, which is kind of unsanitary to think about it, where does the waste come out? On the top. So they kind of poop on themselves. <laughs> that always makes for a good story. <laughs> so I'm going to get a, a petri dish, and we're going to inject this guy. There's a snake. So I'm just going to punch up this a little bit to make sure where it is right. Now, while I'm doing this, have you all been successful getting your, uh, except for you guys, have you all been successful getting your light going? That light's not working either? Yeah, you have, if the light's on, you just have to move it around until you can get the light where you want it. Now I'm going to put two milliliters into the sea urchin. It will take about ten minutes for us to be able to tell if it's if it's fertile. The other side of that, of course, is you know these have separate sex, so I'll be able to tell if it's a boy or a girl. But if we're going to do the fertilization, I'm going to have to do this a second time or a third time. If I'm lucky, by the third time I'll have both a male and a female. We shall see. This is why we have Plan B on the pit on every activity. <laughs> So I'm injecting this slowly into the urchin. I want to show you what happens. This is the reason why I think it might be neurological. Um, watch, watch the activity on the spines. I don't know if you can see it. Usually they start twitching around quite a bit. I can feel it quite a bit. Like other animals, we keep them in aquariums. The sea urchins were some of the hardest ones to transport. They seem to be affected by the lower, lower dissolved oxygen quite a bit. So if you see in the touch tank sea urchins with their needles laying down, their spines laying down, point it out to the Aquarius because that's probably one that's in distress. What I ended up doing for transporting them is I tried to do it in buckets of water, that the water would warm up. And basically, I think it had more to do with dissolved oxygen. There was less dissolved oxygen in there. Because in order to move them, what I ended up doing was I would take newspaper and I'd soak newspaper in seawater and wrap them in uh, newspaper and then stick them in the butt so I wouldn't have them in standing water, but I could keep them moist. Now, how does that keep them alive? Well, it gets back to when you look at the test from the sea urchin and you hold it up to the light, which is one of the things that you can do to sh show people this, there's pores in the test. And what they do is they stick their gills out through those holes. And so by sticking their gills out through the holes and having enough moisture around the gills, they can actually pull the oxygen out of the air. So I was able to keep them alive just wrapping them in wet uh, newspaper. Okay, so it's not really doing anything just yet. So let's, let me move on a little bit. I want to talk to you a little bit about classification because when we talk to the public, we're usually using um, common scientific, we don't use the scientific names. It's important to actually know the nomenclature. How many of you are familiar with this system? Kingdom, file, class, order, family. You've seen it. Almost everybody, right? Do you, do you know how to remember it? Do you have a mnemonic for it? What, what do you use, Ed? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> this is a good one, but I forget. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the things that I would do when I was teaching these classes, I'd ask people to come up with a mnemonic. You know what a mnemonic is. In this case, kingdom phylum, class, order, family, chain, species. You may know all those words, but how do you remember the order? So one of the simpler ones is King Philip came over for good spices. So if you can come up with a, a series of words that actually makes sense to you, you'll remember it. So I did this for a community college class, and I asked them to come up with ones. The best one they came up with was, kinky people can often find good sex. <laughs> I don't use that with the kids, okay? <laughs> but then everybody's going to remember. They're going to remember that. There you go. So you remember the order in which these are. So these go from large, you know, from very broad to very narrow for its species. So, yeah, kinky people can often find good sex. Um, this is a really uh, this is one, this is another one of those presentations that Ralph and I worked on together, and the the highlighted words are kind of interesting because that's kind of the, the caveat. In other words, a group of organisms capable of willingly breeding, as, as opposed to forcing animals to breed together, and in nature producing fertile offspring. So we actually have a really good story here at the uh, Marine Science Center that was told by um, Scott Baker. He was down in Japan. And he did this research very surreptitiously. He took his genetics lab with him because he was wanting to investigate the whale that they were selling, the whale flesh that they were selling in Japan. Because they're saying that it was strictly minky whales, which is the smallest of the baleen whales. Um, they have a permit in Japan to take a certain number of minky whales. He wasn't sure that they were abiding by the rules. So what he did was he tested the genetics of the, of the minky whale meat. What he found was really interesting. A whole bunch of it wasn't minky. But the most interesting one that he did find was a hybrid between a blue whale and a fin whale. Now many of you know the blue whale's the largest, and the fin whale's the next largest. If you come to the uh, Whale Watch Week, um, we'll do an audio recording that will show you the difference in the sounds between the minky and the blue. They sound entirely different, but they do make the same low frequency sound. The question I had for Scott that he wasn't able to answer for me was, if these two animals are breeding, first was why, and second was it fertile. Well, the why he thought he had an answer. He thought that was because they're so it's so difficult to find another fin whale or another blue whale that they might be interbreeding. The question is to whether or not then, is this like a horse and a donkey making a mule, which is sterile, which would be really kind of bad because if all that energy went to making an animal that really can't reproduce. He couldn't answer. So we don't we know that. This happens because genetically we've been able to see it, that we can have something that isn't necessarily a new species. It's a hybrid, so it's even below species in the taxonomical layer. And in this case, producing fertile offspring is a critical aspect of it, whether or not it's fertile or not. Um, we don't know that. This is the, this is the, these are the, the two things that I'd love to hear you say a lot to the public as you're talking to them in the uh, touch panel. Because it's basically everything in here can be divided into three basic groups. They could either be asymmetrical, put an A in front of a word, it means it's not symmetric, and that would be like a sponge, something that grows irregularly. They could be bilaterally symmetrical, which means that you can cut them straight down the path and you have equal parts on both sides. We're a good example of bilateral symmetry. Or they could be radially symmetrical which would be like the sea urchin and the sea star. Now, some of these are not as obvious as you would expect. My favorite one is the one that people ask you about a lot, and that's the sea cucumber. If you look at the sea cucumber, everybody knows the sea cucumber, right? Because we all did the touch can. And it looks like kind of like a cucumber, right? But is it radially or bilaterally symmetrical? What do you think? Is it asymmetrical? I could be that too, right? So uh, we could we could rule by democracy, but let me give you a clue. You've all cut a cucumber, and if you take a cucumber and if you cut it like this, they all look the same, right? It is it is radially symmetrical going down the middle of the medium line, so it's not bilaterally symmetrical. So that's kind of confusing. But then that kind of if you start talking about the phylum, in this case we're talking about where the sea stars and the sea urchins are, the echinoderms. 
they are radially symmetrical. And if you said that the sea cucumber is in that phylum and it's radially symmetrical, you sort of have to explain how it's radially symmetrical. Does this make sense? Or am I going too fast? Are you talking about a regular cucumber? Like, like yeah. Eat a cucumber, but you cut fast? Yeah, well, so it, it looks the same too. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. It does. But in, in, maybe I should do something other than cutting a red, regular cucumber. Um, <laughs> any ideas, Doug? Anything else I could come up with on that? I guess, I guess in this case, what you can do is trust me that you can get multiple cuts of the same of the same uh, symmetry. Where in bilaterally symmetrical, the by the two part is really important. In other words, if you cut me here, I'd have two eyes on either side. If you cut me like this, so where you make the cut sort of makes a difference, right. you know, as far as you know, being the same on both sides. But that's always been somewhat the exception to the rule. So the the radial symmetry, top and bottom, the bilateral symmetry, front and back, left and right. So it's sort of where you would make the cut. These are kind of great little questions to ask the public as they're looking at things, because they'll start to pay attention to the, the form, the, or, the order of it. So then, if they look at a picnicodium, if they look at a sunflower star, and they see all the arms on it, they, they probably realize it's a sea star, but not recognizing that the number of arms does make a difference. By the way, with sun, sun, sunflower stars, when they're born, they have very few arms. They, as they get bigger, they grow more and more arms. That's another thing that's about its age. So, I already mentioned the, the sponges. That's that fancy word there, peripheral. And then the nigeria, which is, <coughs> which is something actually we're going to have another talk on later on today. So I'm just, I'm just introducing that as the two different um, phylums. So, um, I'm not going to go into the detail with this just yet, because I think we'll have time to do that um, in the afternoon. At this point, I only have a couple of minutes, and I'm kind of waiting for any kind of action on this part. And uh, I don't know. Normally, by this time, you, you'd see a lot more gametes out. At this point, I'm not sure I see much, but unless I'm imagining it, it's a boy. Because it looks a little white. But it might be really immature, so it's not putting much out in the way of sperm. Yeah, and, and, and just a little back history on this. The sperm only live about 20 minutes, and so they have to put out millions of sperm when, it, when it's time. And what triggers them is actually the female. So the female, when she puts out her gametes, it causes, it's basically a chemical that goes in the water, which causes the males then to spawn. So the, fe the males don't spawn until the females spawn, which makes a lot of sense. Then um, this process is, is a broadcast spawning, which means that it's just out in the water and it comes out. They have to have so many gametes just to increase the opportunity for the fertilization to take place. But I tell you what, I'm not going to torture this animal anymore. I'm going to put it back in the water, and what we're going to do is um, I'm going to wait till you guys come back in the afternoon, and we're going to do some microscope work, and we're going to go back through the other uh, classifications. Because I promised that I'd stop at 10.30. Um, the only thing have to develop, so that you get two things. You get uh, a change in the photo period. In other words, as, as the light gets longer, the gonads start to develop. Why is that critical? Because once the larvae are developed, they're really, really small, and they have to be planted. And for, so there has to be plankton in the water, or else everybody would die. So functionally, they don't want to release the, the gonads too, I mean, the uh, gametes too early, but they want to make it so that, that basically they start developing even before there's food in the water for the gametes. I've got more questions. What triggers the egg release? What triggers the egg release? So, um, initially, I guess I can't answer that for sure. Uh, initially, it's, it's uh, the ripeness of the gonads, and then when one releases it, then there's pheromones that were fed and the other ones. Group sex. The question is, is have I experimented with part of the genesis with the sea urchins? No, but I have done one thing that was. Um, little different. Um, we, we divided an egg into two and got it to grow. So I had clone, I cloned them, but I haven't done the part of the genetic part of it. Yeah. 
Any other questions?